All right. So today we'll be discussing uh, two quite different topics, but it just kind of finishes off the first batch of the lecture slides. Uh, we're going to begin with energy, which is very relevant to your um, practical assignment. And then we'll move on to kind of an introduction to embedded operating systems. This will be followed in the next lecture by more detail on FreeRTOS, which is the operating system you're going to move towards in the assignment. Uh, and then Yolanda will pick up with some more kind of fundamental real-time scheduling the week after. Um, so it is quite tied to the assignment, all of these uh, slides. And I think once you get to um, programming, uh, energy, and OS especially, hopefully it directly supports. So let's start off a little bit with why energy matters. And... Um, of course, you could put all of this in the bigger context of um, our current rather extreme need for energy conservation and, and these kinds of things. But of course, our little embedded sensors are not really the biggest consumers of electricity, no matter how badly you program them. Things like your laptops or the most trivial home appliance you might plug into the wall are going to consume more electricity than, than our devices. But that doesn't mean that we don't still have an energy management problem or um, uh, you know, kind of an environmental responsibility for these devices. But the first most fundamental reason why energy matters for these systems is that cables are really, really expensive. And that might sound strange because you all have a bunch of them in your room and you didn't pay that much for them. But if you think about a building like this um, and we decide to install a new network, let's imagine for the light bulbs, they're now gonna be smart and you literally wanted to run a new cable to every light bulb, that would probably cost you in this building, my guess, several tens of thousands of euros. Certainly tens of thousands of euros. Someone's going to visit every room. They're going to lay that new cable. They have to make a profit. You know, um, It's not very different in industrial environments like factories. And while you know, adding a cable for our light bulbs to network might be a bit uh, silly, it's increasingly standard to add some kind of communication to every um, conveyor belt segment. For example, to tell you how many objects passed along it, to every um, motor to see if it's vibrating too much and needs to be serviced. So if you really imagine running dedicated cables across a factory, it gets expensive really quick. And kind of strangely in this particular area, the electrical engineers who've been designing microcontrollers for the last 40 years have been far too successful. So your microcontroller, the thing doing the work, might cost you 10 cents. But the cable that would actually get the information out of the microcontroller might cost you 1,000 euros, which is insane, right? So we have a, a really strong motivation for truly autonomous nodes. That obviously touches networking, which we don't do a lot of in this course, but that, that pushes us to drive our communication wireless. Uh, but it also means that we have to think about power cables themselves. Um, What's good about this from a research perspective is that it's a really knotty problem. So while your microcontroller gets smaller and smaller each year at fixed power, or vice versa, you know, um, gets more um, uh, powerful each year at fixed size, batteries follow a quite different trajectory. There are big battery innovations. They do get better. And you'll hear like exciting news about solid state batteries right now, for example might make a huge difference for electric cars, things like this. But, but progress is lumpy and unpredictable. So it, it doesn't mean that anybody should expect for our embedded devices to have like a magic battery tomorrow, which is twice as good. Nobody expects that. Um, and that means that basically in hardware, not our primary concern, but also in software, we have to take a lot of care to make sure that we don't have to do um, frequent battery replacement. Of course, imagine the alternative. Uh, there are two possibilities. Uh, the first possibility is that you actually get someone to change the batteries. Well, remember why a lot of these things were going to batteries in the first place, right? We didn't want to run those extra cables. Uh, if you now have to have a guy who goes out and literally changes the batteries every, what, week, month, year, few years, we're saying there'll be hundreds of billions of IoT devices. So, you know, that's a lot of people that you have to pay to go and change those batteries. 
A second kind of way of thinking about it, which I think does become rather irresponsible and connects us back to that environmental discussion at the start, is that maybe these things should be disposable. But honestly, I think from an engineer's perspective, that's a pretty terrible idea. Because what you're saying then is that the toxic chemicals in the battery should just be like thrown out there in the environment and forgotten about. Uh, that these things should be potentially needlessly manufactured over and over again, spending the resources to make the new sensor node, because it's cheaper to make them than to send someone to change the batteries. So if you want to avoid that kind of, um, what's the word, either that kind of wasteful and uh, destructive internet of crap kind of uh, vision, or that expensive and rather infeasible kind of battery changing problem, then you really need to be good with energy. Um, I think I spoke over this slide a little bit. But, but uh, to make it a bit more practical, maybe, uh, in the spin-off that we, we made in the area of the industrial IoT from Distronet, one of the key selling points of that spin-off was that you could take one of the devices with a, a range of these plug-in sensors, and you wouldn't need to change the battery for 10 years in many realistic scenarios. Of course, it changes per scenario, but 10 years is a nice benchmark you can give for certain kinds of apps. Um, that means you dramatically reduce those maintenance costs and you can increase what's called return on investment. So, you know, much quicker after you buy a system that doesn't need that kind of maintenance, can you start seeing the savings it should offer? And remember, if you think back to the, um, uh, the first lecture where we talked about apps, many of the applications in this space are all about efficiency anyway. So you're deploying your IoT node on the motor to make sure it doesn't vibrate too much and cause you downtime, losing you money. But that means that all the IoT profit to be made is kind of in that margin, right? It's in the margin of the waste you eliminate. So uh, that means that people who buy IoT systems in general, and I don't think this will change, have a very low tolerance for high maintenance costs. I mentioned the environmental concerns, but just to be a bit more concrete, um, the best batteries we can buy have nasty stuff in them, things like cadmium, mercury, lead, and lithium. Um, in addition, they don't decompose quickly. So like, imagine you're doing, I don't know, smart agriculture. You really couldn't actually just have disposable devices and start dumping them in farmers' fields. That would be incredibly irresponsible and probably would actually have some even short-term uh, impact on um, the outcomes from those farms. Um, there are kinds of batteries that are better. Some batteries are better than others, so the really crummy kind of carbon batteries, those are the cheap ones in the supermarket that don't even say alkaline on them. Um, they're probably a little bit uh, better in terms of disposal, but they have so little charge. So there's no, there's no real kind of magic battery there again, which can be totally environmentally friendly, so you don't have to worry anymore about disposability. This is kind of a funny uh, image uh, these days, but way back when, around the aughts, uh, there was some, an idea called smart dust, which really kicked off, uh, this is from UC Berkeley originally, and it really kicked off a lot of the current IoT research. It's just an interesting idea. What if we could build a computer so small that they could be just scattered arbitrarily in the environment? It now looks rather archaic, I think, because in the smart dust vision, each one of those things really has a battery, right? So you'd just be literally like throwing toxic chemicals around the room. But it was already 20 years ago, so you know, um, times I think have positively there moved on. Any questions on the context before I move into a bit of the problem scope? Everyone buys that energy management is good and a positive thing, that's good. Um, so if we think about the software part of energy management, it kind of touches hardware too, but many things, you need basic hardware support to do any very low power system or any um, energy aware system, but you don't need much. A lot of what you can do in hardware can be replicated in software, so long as you can sense how much charge you have, where the charge is coming in, some basic things like that. And maybe if you can remember the, the I.O. lecture where we talked about you know, kind of sensing the physical world, you can already tell that for a lot of those things, your basic ADC on your microcontroller can give you some clues as to how much power you're getting and you know, how much charge is in a supercapacitor or things like this. 
But anyway, this is a problem in three parts, and it, it rather looks like kind of an economic problem in a way. So you have the energy consumption part of that problem. We completely control this in software for any sensible system. Remember, we talked about sleeping a microcontroller in order to save power. How often you wake from sleep mode and how, mo and how long you keep the node running its software will directly determine your energy consumption. But of course, you have a certain application that you're going to need to serve. So the question there is, it's a minimization problem, but how much can you minimize consumption while still serving the application well? Which practically means, what's the least you can wake up? Um, how quick can you get your work done before you get back to sleep? There's some nuance there, but not a lot. That's really the, the majority of the energy consumption problem. The second question is one of energy storage. Um, from our perspective, a lot of that is a selection problem. Um, so if you were building a system tomorrow, should you pick a battery or a supercapacitor? Should it have some kind of energy harvesting like solar power? Um, and while we don't build those things, your application can, can really lead to very different choices. I'll come back to that later in the lecture. Finally, we have the energy production part of the problem. So there are lots of ways we can gather energy from the environment. Um, solar power is a great example. Uh, those, you know, those kind of crummy solar garden lights that you see, they're typically like a euro or two, and you can find them in kind of um, tack shops. Um, you could take the same thing, wire it up to your microcontroller, probably a couple of them, because they're kind of low voltage, and you could start running something. So solar is really easy, but it isn't everywhere. Other options include things like radio frequency, energy harvesting, which is much harder, but you know, it means you can draw power from the wireless mic, the, the Wi-Fi, uh, electrical noise from things like motors and so on. And um, of course, also things like anywhere you have uh, an abundant source of energy. Thermal energy is very easy to do. Vibration is easy, but unfortunately you have to tune it. All of those are potential options for your application. And for some of them, you can just basically buy a plug-in module which will give you a certain amount of energy. Once, uh, so, so these two things have kind of a selection element. This is really very software driven in order to, to minimize our energy consumption. But all of these can be kind of optimized together. So if you have some flexibility in your application, for example, you might choose to do more work when you have some energy being produced. Imagine in a solar system, you need to send a daily digest of messages. Well, send away while the sun is shining bright and maybe economize uh, when you have uh, less energy available. Very, very simple in principle. Take the software side, the energy consumption side as well. Not all software is uh, ON, right? So depending on what you're doing, things might take longer to execute. You may be working on a log that's going to grow in size, and your software takes longer. Um, as the energy consumption of different tasks in your software increases, again, we can be creative if we like. We can adjust our uh, execution rates based on their the weight. Another good example is if you're using sensors on a device. Um, many sensors do not consume the same amount of energy uh, depending on the phenomena they're sensing. There are literally sensors where, current loop sensors, for example, where the power consumption will go up and down in line with the phenomena being monitored. So it's not a tremendously complicated problem. Um, our goal is to, is to um, kind of tie these things together in a sensible kind of uh, software-driven uh, way so that we don't end up exhausting our energy storage and we somehow find balance within the lifetime of our app. OK. Um, and maybe as well, when I talk about application lifetimes, um, these vary radically in industry. But, but I can tell you that because the IoT often involves the deployment of hardware, very, few, I mean, outside of kind of consumer kind of random gadgets and stuff, almost nobody in industry would be talking about battery lifetimes of days or weeks to do anything interesting. Because again, at that point, they have a disposal or a maintenance problem. So typical lifetimes you're looking at are measured in years. For a smart meter case we're doing right now, they have a 15-year minimum lifetime. 
So imagine writing the software for that. It might not be super duper complicated, but if you, if you mess up, if there's a bug somewhere and you end up keeping the meter on, then all of a sudden, you know, a million meters potentially have to be visited and have to be, um, have a maintenance intervention because of a bug in your software somewhere. So we're really talking about long lifetimes. Mobile devices are a bit different. Of course, you know, typically there we're talking about days, not years. All right, so let's talk about energy consumption. I'm going to start with computation. So um, this, this is one of the highest current draws typically in your system. The radio is very similar typically. Depending on what radio, what processor, um, either one might be higher. Um, one thing to note about uh, our microcontrollers these days is that typically we can clock them at a wide range of uh, frequencies. And the power that they're going to consume is going to be proportional to the frequency they're clocked at. So let's take a practical example, um, your, the app mega that you have. In principle, you can clock it from 0 to 20 megahertz. You have to spec the crystal if you want anything over 16 megahertz, I think. Um, but, but you have this range. It's fully static in the sense that any clean signal, even at extremely low clock rates, will, will still cause it to operate correctly in an electrical sense. So you could literally have like um, a debounced button, and you could press that button, and that could cause your CPU to cycle, you know, if you were, if you were crazy. Um, it's kind of cool because you have that energy proportionality to think about, oh, it could have a really very low clocked microcontroller and do weird stuff. But as I'll explain in a bit, that almost never works out. So you're, while, while these, uh, the energy used is proportional to your clock speed, if your software is good, there's almost never a reason to, to set your main clock real slow. Because, of course, when it runs faster, it does the work quicker. So you can get back to sleep mode quicker. Um, because, so, so you've got to remember as well that the um, amount of energy, the total amount of energy we'll consume is um, a product of the instantaneous power draw, but also the time. So hardware acceleration here can also make a big difference. Um, if you have like crypto acceleration and your crypto is now a thousand times faster, well, that's probably going to be a thousand times less energy too, roughly speaking. Here you can see for your um, at mega, uh, the, different, the, the current draw at different clock frequencies. Um, you'll, no, you'll note as well, this is kind of uh, probably a little bit out of scope for this course, but the actual voltage you run it at kind of limits the top clock speed available. So you can run your at mega all the way down to 1.8 volts, which for example, if you're doing something with like a supercapacitor and a solar panel might be attractive. But you can only run at 4 megahertz, absolute max. And as you increase the voltage, your maximum clock speed increases. Uh, but at the same time, so too does your power. Shown here as current. I think this is a, th uh, oh no, we have the voltages on the different lines. But shown here as current, which you can easily convert into watts. What else to say here? Well, you can see that. Um, in general, you should run at the lowest voltage which can achieve the clock speed that you get. It's more efficient to run at 4 megahertz at 1.8 volts than it is at anything higher. This is typically true for, um, for most microcontrollers that you would buy. Now let's go back to that sleep mode. Um, so the, the sleep mode on a microcontroller is special. That main clock is not running at all. And that means you can do lots of cool electrical tricks to drive down power consumption. Typically, it's going to be at least a 1,000 times lower power consumption uh, than any kind of active mode. So if we jump back to the app mega right here, uh, let's see if that checks out. So an 8 megahertz app mega consumes about 6 milliamps. It's about 6 microamps in sleep, so roughly, roughly, roughly. That kind of holds. As you get down to the lower clock speeds, it, it wouldn't quite be true. So roughly a thousand times less power when you're in sleep mode. I think I kind of answered this question. So I'm going to skip past it. The, the, the important thing to remember here is that if you have such a thing as sleep mode, 
then economizing on clock speed is, is really a good idea because you can run very fast and then spend more time in sleep mode when you return to it. So it becomes kind of, for, for a perfect piece of software, um, and imagine that you, you know, you're at 4.5 volts, you may as well run at 20 megahertz because the amount of work you do is proportional to this, so is the energy, but you're spending more time now in sleep mode than you were before. A major caveat to that is that that assumes perfect software. Imagine, though, you do not write perfect software and you have a lot of busy waits. So a busy wait is when you enter active mode to do a job, like uh, read a peripheral over I squared C, like we saw in the I.O. lecture. Now, what you should do in an ideal piece of software is read it, go back to sleep, get an interrupt, wake up, receive the result. But that's a lot of work, and it's, it's error-prone programming. So what many people will do is just stay awake until the result comes. Now it gets kind of fuzzy, right? Because, well, if I'm burning, if I'm burning different amounts of power while I'm sitting there waiting for I.O. to complete, maybe I should lower the clock speed. In the end, for, for perfect interrupt-driven code that sleeps at every opportunity as possible, you should run fast. Um, there are papers, though, which have tried, which have, for example, taken existing uh, code out there and shown that different clock speeds can produce better results, stuff like this. It's kind of niche, though. Any questions on the clock or sleep mode? No? Okay. We saw, I think, in the time lecture um, already that the, the main thing to remember, though, is that not many things can wake you from the deep sleep mode. Typically, it's pin changes and things like this. So um, you need something external to wake you up from that super low power mode that you have. It can be a peripheral, can be a button press, uh, things like this. Let's jump back to our memory. You'll recall that I, at the time, I, I already said there are different costs um, associated with that in terms of energy. Let's go through each one again briefly. I'm going to start at the bottom with flash. This is typically, and I'm using the Arduino terminology now, flash is the paged EEPROM, not the byte-wise EEPROM. It costs nothing to maintain flash. We store our program there. We never pay a joule of energy in order to maintain that program. It's also cheap to read. So as we read our instructions, it's not terribly expensive. But writing to it is high. Again, you can see why we store our programs in Flash, right? You don't rewrite the program every second or every minute, so this is perfect for storing big chunks of stuff that don't change much. The EEPROM, on the other hand, also costs us nothing to maintain, is, is cheap to read, and is kind of expensive to write, but not as bad as this one. Why would that be so? It's the same kind of basic memory, but why is the EEPROM going to typically be lower cost to write? Because you can write bytes, right? I mean, you'd have to get very lucky that you actually want to write pages. Um, if you wanted to write exactly a page, they'd be the same. SRAM is low all around. It, it costs very little energy to maintain. We can read it, and we can write it with very low energy. Um, e SRAM is energy proportional, so that assumes like n a normal microcontroller. If you got the biggest SRAM that you could and you have to power that, well, then you'll be spending you know, more power. But for the kinds of um, memory sizes you'll see on any conventional micro, uh, the SRAM storage is very cheap. And that is something that, in my view, for, for modern IoT systems is really underexploited because um, let me try and think of an example to show how low it is. Ah, okay. So I, I remember um, a good online piece assessing why an Arduino would not properly reset under some conditions. And it turned out that even when unplugged, uh, an LED, which is, which is attached to the Arduino, was sufficient. OK, that requires a bit of a digression. But an LED is also a mini solar panel, uh, a very poor quality solar panel. But even that tiny amount of energy was enough to keep the SRAM active. So it was a rather um, exotic app. But even such a low current as the uh, reverse, the reverse uh, output of the LED under normal light could keep your SRAM going. 
Normally, though, low-end micros don't give you the facility to keep the SRAM powered and then you know, uh, kill the rest of the system. Some very, some very advanced Cortex-M4s and stuff do, but for you guys, typically not, which is a shame because then you could have kind of like, all you'd have to do is uh, persist and restore your registers and you could have kind of instant restart as well as uh, reboot. But typically, we don't have that. Finally, we have the DRAM. You won't see it on the lowest end systems, um, but it, it costs quite a bit to maintain. Again, so remember why DRAM costs more than SRAM? Right, exactly. Uh, the data will be lost if you don't refresh it, so you have to have an active kind of memory controller which is going to go along the rows of the DRAM and refresh it. Um, but it's cheaper and it's more compact which is the same thing actually in silicon. So uh, this ends up being used once you get to gateways up, more or less. So kind of just a recap, but, but you do have some options already here in software, right? So if you're thinking about logging on your Arduino, as an example, and I don't think this impacts your assignment, um, you would obviously, most naturally, if you have to have something last across reboots, First of all, log to the EEPROM because it's, it's the cheapest way to do it. If you had too much data, you could log to the flash in pages. It's kind of complicated, but you can do it. Another option, though, which would be uh, more advanced is, I said across reboots, right? So if power is not going to be lost, you can do a special trick with the compiler, and you can mark your variables as do not clear. Remember, SRAM is really fundamentally static. When you reboot, you have to clear all of the SRAM. Otherwise, its values would be the same as before you reboot it. You can, you can tag variables not to do that in the compiler. So if you knew you had power and that was sufficient for you, then you could perhaps log to SRAM across reboots. And of course, you can imagine strategies where you'd start to do mixes of them, right? So you'd, you'd begin with an SRAM logger every n seconds or n updates, you push it to EEPROM, you load it. All kinds of um, creativity can be imagined, even with your crummy little Arduino. I'll talk about peripherals a little bit here. This slide is super fuzzy, because I don't want to go into a 100 different specific peripherals, but every peripheral is really a little bit different. So. Um, this is a very rough rule of thumb kind of table that, you know, if I'm thinking about a design for something and it's day zero, then this is more or less how I think about it. Um, so here I have the, the, um, uh, the peripherals divided according to three factors, power consumption, uh, the cycle time, and whether that power is static. So this is just how much uh, juice they draw. The cycle time is how long it takes to just get your data out. I don't say uh, response time because some peripherals can have like uh, preparation phases and so on and so forth. So I mean the whole end-to-end -end thing from beginning to use it to get your data out. And the static column just refers to whether or not that will be the same on every execution. Um, if we look at interrupt-based detectors of different kinds, so there I use the example of a PIR sensor, the thing in your burglar alarm, a passive infrared. Really handy little sensors and fun for projects. They can detect when a person or a large animal is within, within view. Cool for making a little Arduino thing in your room or something. Um, they consume a medium amount of power because obviously there's something active going on for these, right? Whether it's a PIR or like a basic accelerometer detecting a drop, if it's going to give you an interrupt on an event, it's generally speaking going to be consuming non-trivial power. Almost always less than your micro, um, if well selected, but still considerable. Cycle times for these are very fast. They're detectors. They're designed to wake you from sleep mode. Uh, but the power consumption is also really static. So take those PIRs, right? They consume more power when there's a person in view because of the way they're designed or an animal, whatever. Um, if there's nobody in view, they consume the least power. So how would you spec that? You could take the worst case, there's someone in front of the sensor 24-7. You could take the best case, both are totally stupid. You could split the difference, 
For this environment, you do very badly, I would say, because the classroom is not used the majority of the time. Um, but just something to think about. If we take our um, kind of serial silicon sensors, here I'm talking about ones that you query. They're generally very low power. They operate very fast and typically are largely static. So these are, these are not detectors, but I'm talking about give me the magnetic flux right now in three axes. Uh, give me a three-axis accelerometer reading. Give me the temperature over I squared C. Normally, the, any sensor that's in this kind of category is neat to work with because, uh, well, it'll be almost trivial power consumption if you use it right. Turn it on, read the sensor, turn it off. Analog voltage things uh, are not quite as fast. The power consumption of them is generally low, and they are also typically effectively static. There are small differences under the hood. The worst kind of things, and these are very widespread in industry, is stuff like current loop. So before we had digital communication, even over cables, we still needed to do long-range sensing, like the, um, the amount of oil in a barrel on the other side of the plant. You can't use voltage as an indicator over very long cables because it, it drops depending on how long the cable is. Current does not. And so current loop sensors, typically 4 to 20 milliamp, are super common in industry. And they will tell you the depth of the oil in the barrel or whatever it is based on how much current they draw. And that means that, um, number one, they draw a large amount of power because you need a decent current range to indicate your value. Um, they're still analog, so they're not that slow to execute. Uh, but their power consumption is far from static. You know, you're, you're looking at a 5x difference in power consumption for that empty barrel to a full barrel on 4 to 20 milliamp current loop. Um, again, why do we go through all this? Well, it's interesting to know what you might have to monitor in order to make sure your, your battery doesn't run out or you remain sustainable and what you can basically just account for one time in a design and say, well, that's, I know what that is. That's static. It's background now. Any questions on the peripheral part? Then I'll move on to the most fuzzy slide of this lecture, and that's the uh, communications side. So there is a good reason that I, I, these are all super fun things for me, and we do loads of work in this area. but. If I mix in any communications in this course, then everything becomes the same. And this will be just like Capital Select or IoT, and it will also be like internet infrastructure as well. Um, so I'm not going to do that. Um, these are well covered, as I say, in things like computer networks for the mainstream things and internet infrastructure. Um, here I'll give, again, a very brief kind of um, overview of their energy implications. So we have three columns now, cost to maintain. So that means, do, is there a cost to just being on the network at all? Some networks, the answer is no, others yes. Then we have the cost to send a message and the cost to receive a message. I think those are pretty obvious. Let's start from the top with Ethernet. Ethernet it, it depends upon some serious magnetic elements and stuff. There is no low power wired Ethernet for our microcontrollers. Not normally a problem because you already put the Ethernet wire. You even have power over Ethernet. So typically, if you run into uh, an embedded system using um, wired Ethernet, you'll have power, actually. And you wouldn't select it otherwise. Wi-Fi is interesting because uh, most of the Wi-Fi that we use in our systems is extremely power consuming. The Wi-Fi in your laptop and your phones and so on, for our little embedded nodes, at least. Hard to make a device last years on Wi-Fi, but actually not impossible. If you are a psycho who remembers the details of the Wi-Fi power-saving elements of the computer networks course, if so, uh, impressive, there are two power-saving modes. Uh, one is a beaconing mode, and the other is kind of like a piggybacking response mode. They're not bad, actually. So if they're properly implemented, you can get multi-year life out of Wi-Fi. There are some practical problems, though. Um, basically, you know, 99.999% of effort in Wi-Fi is ongoing fast, really. So there are not many chips you can get that do this well. But there are a few. Um, 
But then, yeah, the second problem is that uh, it's, it's not really widely accepted in IoT or especially industrial IoT spaces for that reason. People associate Wi-Fi with high power, high speed. Um, but as you can see here, um, if you're not sending much or receiving much, then it's not impossible to build a low power IoT system on this network. Uh, moving along, we end up with things like mesh networks. So uh, these are things like time synchronized mesh protocol. Bluetooth mesh is increasingly coming. Um, and also things like six tish. A mesh uses a collection of short range radios. Each one of them routes themselves to cover bigger distances. So, you know, in, in this scenario, it's hard to do in this uh, lecture theater, but we could, oh, the light bulbs are good. You could say the light bulbs are going to make a mesh. They only have a Zigbee radio, like 20 meters range. That's plenty, so long as they all route, right? Um, participating in such a network has a, med a medium level of cost. Why? Because once you're a router, you're going to have to wake up for other people's messages as well as your own. Um, having said that, you're using a short range, low power radio now, so it's actually quite cheap to send and receive messages. So there you have a real distinction with even the uh, efficient embedded versions of Wi-Fi, right? So here, we can, with the right implementation, hang out on the network, but we've got to be really careful what we send and receive. In this case, yeah, okay, we, we pay a similar price to hang out on the network, but we can send and receive a lot more on this system without running our battery dead. Moving along, to, so something like Bluetooth LE. Um, I'm just talking about here um, normal non-meshed Bluetooth. This is, this is a simple short-range radio. If you're within range of it, and that range is expected to be 10 to 100 meters, depending on the configuration, then you can get a message. If you aren't, you don't get a message. Um, these are very, very cheap to participate in because w every, um, the gateway is going to listen all the time. The nodes don't have to organize anything before sending a message so you can be in deep sleep mode. You wake up, send your message, maybe listen after you send it if you need to receive one, and that's all that you're going to do. So these have the absolute lowest cost in terms of participation and sending and receiving messages. But of course, they only get you one hop. So if you imagine that factory we talked about before, you'd either have a big new problem of installing so many Bluetooth gateways, not as many as um, cables to every sensor, but still quite a lot, uh, or otherwise you'd have to start looking into those meshes to cover the distance. The last two I mentioned here are different versions of the, the new class of low power wide area network. So these aim to give you very low bandwidth cell-ish technologies. LoRa is a very open version of this. You can buy your own LoRa gateway. You're using it in the assignments, so you guys all know LoRa at this point. Uh, you probably won't be super impressed with the range if you try and measure it with your nodes because um, in like a suburban setting without correct placement and those crappy little antennas, I wouldn't expect more than, let's say, several hundred meters. But, you know, you put one on the roof, you can definitely get four or five kilometers um, with a normal gateway on this building, for example. Sending on these networks is always an energy consuming um, operation. Why? There's two reasons, actually. The first is that, you know, the base station's far away, so you crank up the power as high as it will go. But the second reason is that they actually deliver long range with really slow modulation techniques. So it's going to take you longer to send the, the data over that network than it would do over Bluetooth, for example. So it costs more power to send, and it's on for longer. Weirdly with LoRa, um, well, not weirdly, I guess, but it costs a lot less power to receive. I think there's a 3 or 4x difference. Um, the last example is a, a cellular network. Um, this is rather high power to participate in, kind of like Wi-Fi, more than mesh, certainly, and it costs a lot of power to send and receive. Still kind of interesting because uh, all the complexity of providing your backhaul is provided by the cell provider, right? So if you could engineer a system that could live with those power numbers, 
you can stop being a network engineer and deploying gateways and stuff, which might be interesting to you. So that's super brief. Um, I guess what might be more interesting even than the specific examples here is just kind of the categories, right? So you should think if you look at a network, is there an ongoing cost to just being on the network? And then also how, how much does it cost to send and receive? And depending on your application, that might mean that you would go for a mesh or LoRa, depending, right? The smart meters, even if you could mesh them, probably wouldn't make any sense. They send very little data. So the impact of the high transmission cost is ameliorated. And um, this cost over that 16 years would add up much more. Questions on any of the materials so far? All right. Then we'll talk a bit about that sleep mode. Um, I said all of this already. In the ideal case, you sleep everywhere. If you do a really good job on your assignment, what I think you will see is that you'll begin with a lot of stuff in that while one loop. Or, you know, later on it's free RTOS equivalent. But the better your assignment gets, the less and less stuff will be in there. And eventually, if you've done a fantastic job, that, will, that loop will be empty. Uh, the only thing being called in that loop will be sleep. That will be it. Because everything else can be interrupt driven. It's gonna, you're going to wake on a timer. You're going to uh, respond to, and I f I'm afraid I forget the exact details because Ashoke manages it, but is it a, is, are the buttons involved? Do we press buttons here at all? Anything like that? We don't know yet. Oh, you don't know? Okay. Well, then we're on the same page. <laughs> but um, you, you can, in th by the end, you'll be able to wake only on time and interrupts, um, which means that you shouldn't have anything in a loop. If you did, that would be weird, right? But this should be a process. Don't aim for that on day, day one, or you'll tie yourself up in knots. The first thing you should do is try and get the functionality working at all. Forget about power, forget about optimality, and then piece by piece, optimize it. Um, I mentioned busy waiting. Just to give you an example, this is like the worst kind of busy waiting that you could have. So this is standard Arduino code. It's in our loop. I've written this code uh, many times. Um, and here what we say is, um, if we have something available on the serial port, then read it and uh, set incoming byte to its value. Uh, you can't sleep if you have an instruction like that. While this is running in your loop method, the CPU is spinning at full power mode, and all of that energy is completely wasted because the serial port also provides you with an interrupt to wake from sleep. So there's an alternative configuration that could be inserted here where you would, be, you would set yourself to go to sleep mode, waking up when you get a serial port interrupt that would be equivalent. Realistically, eliminating all busy waiting is very difficult. That means you really have perfect embedded code if it's all gone. Uh, but that's what you should step by step aim for. Um, it's rather, this last example is rather extreme. So here it's very clear, I think, that this is a bad idea. Uh, but literally, doing your I squared C, uh, read and, or read and writes, uh, you can go to sleep in between those for non-trivial amounts of time. Uh, and theoretically, that's what you should be doing to save energy. Obviously, it would be the very last thing I would touch or attempt in any program. OK. So that brings us to the notion of duty cycling. I'm sure I've slipped and used this term tons already in the lectures because it's uh, so baked into what we do. But your duty cycle determines how much of your time you're going to be awake and how much you're going to be asleep. The most energy efficient systems have extremely low duty cycles. So for example, a 1% duty cycle means we're awake 1% of the time, asleep 99%. Um, Things like the TSMP network that we studied in computer networks, it's a mesh network if you didn't do that course, um, can achieve 99.99x percent duty cycles while sending once every 10 seconds, which is very impressive. Even within that duty cycle, though, of course, we have uh, some differences. So that 1% might mean that we wake up for 10 milliseconds every second. Um, or alternatively, 
uh, it might mean that we are awake um, for 10 seconds every 1,000 seconds. Both of those will give us the same duty cycle. But they're going to be very different for your application, obviously. This first one, to a human, will likely appear extremely responsive. The second one will obviously not appear responsive at all, and it's something you're going to have to wait for. The, application's going to determine, the application responsiveness is going to determine um, how often you need to wake up, typically. Um, Human-centered things will need to be quicker. Routing-based things need to be quicker. Generally, if it's something that's kind of automating, I don't know, the smart meters, for example, probably wake up literally once a day. The best way to optimize your power before doing anything too crazy is just to align all your tasks as much as you can in uh, time. So make sure that everything uh, is clustered together, is done as much as you can in the same wake-up, and you don't have more wake-ups. Execute them all as quickly as possible. So that just means good code, and typically at the top speed the CPU will allow you. And then get back to sleep as quickly as possible. Very, very simple. Um, there are very few cases where other strategies will give you better results. They do exist, but they're rare. So that's our duty cycle. How do we actually ensure that we don't waste energy? And these are good rules for the assignment, for sure. So the first thing is to make sure you turned it off. The amount of times I've seen like good code and a student's like, ah, but my energy numbers don't make any sense, and the LED is on, are uh, like untrue. Like if there's something shining at you on the board, it cannot be in a good power mode. Um, but if you're new to this, that's not necessarily totally obvious. So you should systematically turn off anything you don't need. Some of it is obvious, the LEDs, like I mentioned, but some of it is not. The ADC consumes a quite, quite a lot of power, um, much more power than you should be using by the end of the assignment. You'll have to explicitly turn off that ADC when you're not using it. The clocks that you don't need. There are several timers on the Arduino. If you aren't using it, turn it off. Be careful, though. Um, if you're using FreeRTOS, some of them are used by the OS. So there'll be a bit of a process, I imagine, of turning it off, everything stops working, turn it back on, and work out what you actually need. You can also do that the right way, of course, by going through uh, the documentation for the board and the, and the uh, OS. But typically, that's going to be less time efficient. Um, Brownout detection um, is another thing. So brownout detection uses the ADC and basically means that you get shut down when the power starts to flake out. Uh, there'll be more things beyond that as well. Serial ports should be turned off. Your I2C should be turned off if you're not using it. If you aren't using it, look at the register for that thing and just turn it off. Once you get used to setting those registers too, it's just grunt work. It's basically just look at what it is, turn it off if you didn't use it. Next up is a bit more esoteric, but always helps. So everything should be in a deterministic state. The, once you've got into good sleep modes, and um, now you're working at microamps um, instead of milliamps, everything starts to, to add up. So for example, if you don't set the state of a pin and it's just floating, that will actually um, leach power from the system. Um, unnoticeable when you're in active mode, would never be a problem. Uh, but once you're in the uh, deep sleep mode, you can actually see it, even on your, uh, the multimeters we give you. So you need to set those into the appropriate state. Google bashing a bit will tell you that one of the two states is better than the other, but the difference is not huge. The main thing is to set them at all. Now, the third point is becoming increasingly important, actually. So. Um, if you're using other system libraries, uh, which I think you will be for the radio, for example, um, you've got to make sure that you get back into sleep mode. And you don't know when those third-party libraries are going to wake up. Um, imagine a, a, like a full-blown network stack, like for a mesh protocol. You wouldn't write that. You'll use somebody else's. Now, that can wake your, your system up arbitrarily. So that means that we're going to need to get back to sleep mode. How do you think we're going to do this, generically? Keep track of time. Keep track of time. That's a good answer. We can keep track of time. We can put ourselves back to sleep if it's been too long. 
But there's an easier way. It's, it's got to be easy too, right? Because you don't know what these libraries are. So how would you always make sure you end up back in sleep mode? Hmm? Ah, completely shut the libraries down. If, if you could, you should, absolutely. But quite often with things like networking or if you take a Bluetooth board, for example, they'll have like over-the-air loaders and all kinds of cool stuff. So like often you can't shut it down. But what's the one way we could know we're always going back to sleep? It's really simple. Check how much the MCU is used. It's another good answer, but it, it's too complicated for this problem. You just put it in the loop. It's the first thing in loop. Eventually, it's the only thing in loop. If it's in the loop, uh, and this is for Arduino, but you'll have something like a loop. Even if you go to your RTOS, right? You're going to have some master control system. So the easiest way to make sure that you're going to go back to sleep if somebody woke you up is to have it right there in your loop or main control system. Then it doesn't matter, right? So the answer is about checking how we're being used. That's fine. That's right on. But in fact, the next time we got an instruction, we say go back to sleep every time. So there can never be a problem. The third-party libraries can wake up. They do their thing. As soon as the control flow returns to us, well, that's it. We tell you to go back to sleep. It's um, especially important for your little board. Well, there's two parts to this. Your little boards have USB, which is um, a nightmare for interrupts because when it's plugged in, it interrupts all the time. So um, this is the only way you can save any power when plugged into USB. But actually, even then, you won't save that much power. So as Ashok will explain, to actually get your power numbers, you'll have to unplug it from the USB and, and power it separately. Another thing that might not be super obvious right now here is um, there's like a strange asymmetry here because these third-party libraries, your software knows nothing about. I mean, you could go into them and you could recode them or something, but, but you shouldn't, you know, in the ideal case, you, you wouldn't do that. So your software will call something like sleep, and it has no way to know if the node has been woken up after that. That's why a lot of the kind of accounting stuff is very hard, because when the control flow returns to you, you don't necessarily even have a real-time clock. You don't know if it's you know, a microsecond later, or it's a week, it's a, a week since you last woke up. Um, and that makes this a little bit difficult to do in a more um, systematic way. There might be 10 wake-ups before your control flow returns, or one. You don't know. OK, any questions on sleep mode? That's more or less all the magic. There's a lot of grunt work to making um, the assignment uh, run well. But if you, do, if you do those things in your code, then you will get good power numbers. Um, I don't know if we'll do it this year. In previous years, we've had kind of like a, a weird little competition thing. So we'll, we'll make the power optimization part. So basically, the thing that you're doing, you'll have to be functionally correct. But then the next goal is to optimize power to the greatest extent possible. And it's kind of fun, because we don't know how far you guys will go. And um, in fact, the first year that we did it, people did a little better than Ashok thought was possible. And I think last year was a little better again. So in principle, you know, anything goes for the power optimization. And it, it is kind of open-ended. So I think that's kind of fun. I don't know if we'll have like a prize or anything. Um, but we'll make it some kind of like leaderboard for the people with the lowest power. Or if it's, if it's not fun, I understand completely. But if you're a geek, some, I know some of you will find it fun. All right. So now we're going to totally change pace again. Th so that was all. Um, we talked about power consumption, what costs us power, and we talked about saving power with sleep mode. Now we're going to jump back real quickly into the, the selection part of the problem for us, things like batteries and super caps. Um, memorizing this stuff is not important for the exam. The main thing to understand is kind of the concerns represented by the columns here in the table, and also the breadth of difference that we have across different technologies. I'll let you read the details at home. I'll give some examples across the table of the kinds of batteries that we, we might get. So the crummy ones I mentioned before, the zinc carbons, those are the lowest of the low. They're, they're the kind that you, you will see at the bottom shelf in the supermarket, um, typically like non-branded. 
Um, you can see that all batteries have a nominal voltage. We only care that that can power our microcontroller. So if it's 1.5 volts, you need three, take two batteries, et cetera. What we do care about as well, though, is their size very often, right? So if we could make our embedded nodes infinitely large, then lots of things would be easy, but we can't. So this next column right here, which is the energy density in uh, megajoules per kilogram here, um, is basically a, me uh, how, yeah, it's the, it's the density of the energy that can be stored. So to put it another way, if you need a certain amount of energy, it determines how small your battery can be. Higher is better. So zinc carbon has terrible energy density. You can see there's a 10x difference between a conventional solid state battery at the bottom of the table. Shelf life is really important. And I think, honestly, the IoT is the, th well, that's not quite true. Apart from weird little niches like emergency lights and stuff, the IoT has really been the first place that operational lifetimes start to collide with shelf lives of the battery. So um, there is no point having a system which operates for 40 years if your battery this chemistry is dead in three to five years. Mm. If everyone's, I'll open a window so ventilation is honored. Hopefully it's not too cold. Oh no, I can't. No, I can. Um, leakage current is also important. So. Batteries self-discharge as well. So there's the shelf life, how long before um, uh, the thing is unusable because its chemistry is just dried out. Then there's the leakage current, so how long before the charge just, think of it like evaporates. Um, and then finally the maximum current they support. So this can vary a lot too. Um, this is about whether or not they can provide you with enough instantaneous power for your biggest job. Let me just go through a couple of interesting points here. Right. So this is kind of interesting. The first interesting point here are the zinc uh, batteries. You'll know these better as hearing aid batteries. Um, so these are extremely dense in terms of energy and have been around for years. Their shelf life is pretty good, um, and their leakage current is pretty good. But these actually have should have a massive asterisk next to them because they depend on um, access to oxygen, and they dry out real quick. So a hearing aid battery is kind of magic because they make them in tiny, tiny formats. They're super energy dense. We have to rip off this kind of seal, and once you do that, they only last like two weeks. So decent shelf life, low leakage current, high maximum current, fantastic, but only for transient applications, like literally throwing some sensor nodes for a week's monitoring. These are the standard kind of Duracells you'll buy at the shop. I'm going to skip over those. They're kind of in the middle. Then finally, we get to one of the more interesting data points down here, which are the new class of lithium thionyl chloride cells. Um, now, what makes them interesting is just that for the first time, uh, we have batteries that offer lifetimes of up to 40 years. So that means that, in principle, if you could get a big enough battery or you could engineer your system well enough, that smart meter can reach its 16-year uh, lifetime with clever code, or even more. It's not totally stupid to think of 40 years, um, in my opinion. Uh, many people working in the space uh, will say, but technology advances so much. Everything will be different in five years. Yeah, but if you put your node in concrete in a parking garage, are you going to chisel them out? Do you really think that what you produce has so little value that in five years it will be up. I mean, it, it's kind of um, a trash kind of mentality for me that like we know we are building and we are deliberately building stuff for obsolescence, so it should be thrown away. Um, but I will grant you it's rather niche. But still, you want to put it in the road, you want to put it in a building. This could be very interesting. Does a modern building last longer than 40 years? Maybe, but not much longer. Um, the solid state batteries at the end are even better. What's cool about these is they make them really tiny. Let me show you. Here you can see um, on this side a uh, totally, um, what's the word, cot. So you can go buy this on DigiKey. 
um, solid state lithium cobalt battery. It looks just like a capacitor if you build circuit boards at all. And actually, I think could have weird sneaky security implications too. Um, but, but this little thing right here offers you a tiny amount of charge, but it will last for many years. And it's, it's an extremely high charge density. Why do I mention this could have weird security implications? Those things are small enough to put on modules. If you buy a module, um, for example, a Bluetooth module, let's say, you don't go and check the caps, right? But you know when you get it that it certainly isn't running anything. It couldn't be. It has no power. It's been depowered uh, since before you got it. But actually, not so anymore. You can imagine uh, chip-sized devices. In reality, they're going to be modules, because this is a, a discrete component, that are actually powered their entire lifetime um, and can be doing arbitrary tasks. It's kind of interesting. These are the ones that we typically use, the 40-year lifetime um, XOL range. I think, honestly, any of the lithium thionyl chloride batteries last the same amount of time, but only Talleyrand has done the 40-year test or whatever. So they're the ones who get the um, name brand. They go as small as the largest watch battery size, and they go as large as a, uh, as a D-cell. So as I say, for you as a software person, this is mostly um, a selection problem, but also potentially an understanding problem. So imagine that you're doing some power um, uh, monitoring, and you want your system to last a long time. If you know that you have a battery which has a low max current, for example, that might be an interesting thing to monitor the use of high current peripherals. You use them too much, you kind of break the battery's discharge curve and endanger its lifetime. So all of those are what we call primary batteries. Um, so that just means non-rechargeable batteries. Let's talk a bit about rechargeable batteries. And it's weird that I didn't talk about these much, right, so far. Well, the big problem with rechargeable batteries, as you can see in this table, is, well, twofold problem is the energy density is much lower, even for the best uh, rechargeable batteries. The highest value we have there in the table is for the lithium ion batteries. Uh, almost half a megajoule per kilogram. Um, on the other hand, we have 1.5 megajoules per kilogram for our solid state primaries. But of course, you can recharge them. So does that even matter? Well, unfortunately, the shelf life is your next problem. Um, the best um, rechargeable batteries that you can get have lifetimes of around five years. If you have a laptop that's got really old, you might have seen it swell up or something once the battery really starts to, to go west. Um, you, you can't have that happening in the field and not know if your node's going to run. So if your application has a, so imagine, let's say, you want to do some sensing as fast as possible. You have a one-year lifetime. Using a solar panel and a rechargeable battery could be a great idea. You move that lifetime to a 10-year lifetime, you've got to forget about the rechargeable batteries right away. In addition, um, there is the issue of self-discharge. Uh, and basically, that's just how much they run dead, even if you're not using it. Um, you're looking at about 3% a month for NIMH or lithium-ion batteries, which is as good as it gets. But it's rather a lot. So now your sleep mode can, uh, your, what you can do in sleep mode is also quite different, right? Because 3% of the battery disappearing in a month might be much more than the actual power you would need to run at a low duty cycle. In addition, with these, you also have like varying charger complexity, which can be a pain. So the main message there from all of that is that um, there's, a, there's basically no way out on the battery side from doing good, power efficient code Rechargeable batteries for short lifespan apps totally make sense. For mobile apps, they're great, because then you have an agent, the user, who can recharge them, and you have no more problem at all. Um, but you need a long life. It can't be rechargeable. Um, and that means that basically the, the field of the IoT has, for the last um, several years, really focused on delivering um, interesting functionality that fits within the leakage current of those uh, primary batteries. Okay, so 
questions on the batteries? Then we'll talk about an alternative. Supercapacitors. So these are super fun. That's why they call them supercapacitors. Um, so supercaps are, operate completely differently than batteries. Um, they don't have a self-life specification as such, but typically their service life is determined by this equation here. You don't need to memorize it. It won't come up on the exam. It's good to know what factors influence it, but I don't care about you calculating anything with this. So what are the uh, terms here? Well, this is obviously the lifetime of the supercapacitor, and it's based upon a uh, function of the lifetime, its lifetime in rated conditions. So that's at a nominal temperature and voltage, adjusted by the, uh, uh, the temperature, excuse me, yes, the, the temperature and the voltage that it's used at, where CT and CV are capacitor-specific parameters taken from the data sheet that determine the impact of temperature and voltage on its lifetime. Um, for many supercapacitors that we can get, the lifetime in not like human normal human conditions, you know, kind of let's say uh, zero to fifty degrees um, centigrade and running, let's say at fifty percent of the specified voltage, can be hundreds or even thousands of years. So in practice, they're not going to be thousands of years um, because things will happen to the packaging and stuff over time, but much, much longer than batteries. And basically something that's so long that in your design, you can cease to consider it. Now, why don't we use them everywhere? They sound cool. They have super in the name. They last forever. Well, unfortunately, their charge density is hundreds of times lower than the batteries that we covered previously, even the rechargeables. So that means that if you wanted to have as much energy in your supercap, it would be much, much bigger than your battery, which is not feasible. So it means that we can use them on our embedded devices, but for a small pool of charge storage. Um, another small note, that the, le the leakage current is significant. Um, not so bad as rechargeable batteries, but often more than primaries. That makes these absolutely ideal for energy harvesting scenarios. So you can either have a, a power source like solar and spec a super cap so it will get you through the night or a long weekend if it's an indoor space where people won't be. Or alternatively, you can start to combine them. So you might have a um, small primary battery that is your basic functionality. And then in addition, you add a super cap and a solar panel from which you can do extra work, or the real work, in fact, because with careful engineering, we've built systems before that can last for weeks on a single supercapacitor doing useful work. Um, a small note on managing maximum load. I don't think this is going to come up in your um, experiments, but it's not impossible. So. Um, there are a number of bottlenecks for the load that can be uh, provided in the systems that you use. The first is, are the batteries themselves. As you can see from our primary batteries, uh, the maximum current supported by our long life batteries is actually very low. I think for a AA it's something like 5 milliamps. So good for Bluetooth, LoRa already out of spec. Um, that's the first bottleneck. The second bottleneck, though, is um, the actual I.O. pins in your device. So they can only supply a certain amount of current to the attached peripherals. You try and supply too much, and the voltage of your device will start to drop. And that causes something uh, we call brownout. Um, this is just where your voltage falls below the, operational, the official operational threshold, and then mileage may vary. You may do OK for a while. Um, you may end up with incorrect results. The point is that you don't know. So to prevent this kind of behavior, our microcontrollers have what's called brownout detection. I mentioned it previously when I said that you should turn it off for the lowest power operation, but that's what it does. It sits there looking whether or not um, the voltage has dropped below where it should be, and if it has, it puts your node into reset. It means you can't run anymore, but you know what the state is at least. Um, there are many systems that I've seen over the years, I think it doesn't apply to your assignment though, where the software here has a role too. Uh, 
So I've seen plenty of systems where if you turn on everything at the same time, then you would always brown out. Um, things like, for example, LED matrices or things like this, where you're not supposed to do everything at the same time. Also, that's often, to be honest, correcting hardware faults. So a hardware designer didn't check something completely. It turns out that if you turn everything on, the board will melt, so don't turn everything on. Now the software developer's problem. OK. So moving on to energy harvesting a little bit. I, I mentioned this already. Um, energy harvesting is a hot topic in the IoT space. It's very fun to do. We're considering putting it in the assignment next year. We just didn't have time for this year, unfortunately. Um, but here I'll go through a few different sources and talk about the challenges. Uh, photovoltaics are interesting. Um, they're very, very easy, honestly. Like, so if you, if you were to take a three volt solar panel under the lighting the conditions that you have here, by the time you're done with your assignment, you'll easily be able to write code that will be able to wake period, so I shouldn't say just the panel, sorry. This, the panel connected to a supercapacitor connected to your Arduino. Um, you'll easily be able to write code that will be able to wake up periodically, do some sensing work, send a message on LoRa or Bluetooth and go back to sleep. The only thing that you need to do is make sure that the panel is big enough, your capacitor is big enough to send that message, and then finally, to sense the amount of charge that's available in the capacitor, which you could just do with your ADC. So the great thing about solar is it's by far the most efficient of all the sources that we have, 10,000 times more efficient or more than RF, for example. It's very cheap, and it's everywhere. Kinetic can also be interesting. It's a bit more niche. And also, um, like many embedded uh, software people, I hate anything that moves. Anything mechanical is a pain because it will break. But if you don't have those kind of um, bigoted views, then um, things like you know, kind of um, vibration, uh, energy harvesting, can be very interesting. These, one, of the not, one of the things here is, though, that um, these kind of things tend to need to be tuned, kinetic and RF. So one of the things that's great about solar is you just hook up the panel to the uh, cap and go. If you want to be fancy and do uh, PowerPoint tracking or whatever you can, if you don't, it's still going to work, and you're still going to do pretty well. Vibration energy harvesting needs tuning to a specific frequency because you have physical components in there like counterweights which have to move a certain amount. And the same is true of RF. RF circuits to do well have to be tuned um, and that means that you can't build easily a generic circuit that can uh, gather energy from the leakage from the plug socket, but also the Wi-Fi. You have to pick and you have to tune. Um, what else to say about those? I think, again, what's interesting here is that they tend to be very dynamic. So when writing software that's doing energy harvesting, uh, imagine solar. Let's stick to that, because we, we can all see an, uh, the light around us and imagine it. Someone can cover up your solar panel. Should your system just stop working if they do? I mean, imagine I cover it with my little mask here. You'll still get some energy, just not as much energy. If it's outside, birds will crap on it, and they will cover up part of the solar panel. It would be really neat if your software would monitor the amount of available power and adjust its behavior. Oh, and by the way, they actually were over time. There are even papers on it. Like, even if nothing happens to it and you keep it clean, the epoxy from the sun will start to, like, go foggy. Um, eventually, it'll just get, like, scratches on it and stuff. So it's actually a very productive uh, and worthwhile software problem to monitor that and just tell your behavior. Even discounting damage and wear, in the course of a normal day, the amount of light available can change by thousands of times. Um, your eyes do a lot of heavy lifting to make sure that you can see in low light and high light conditions. So the amount of light available in this room here might be somewhere in the order of like, it's pretty chill, maybe 250 lumen, something like this. You'll get to 10,000 lumen when the sun comes out, even on a winter's day. So again, imagine the different functionality that you could support with those two things. You might be able to do your sensing indoors in the gloom, but whatever's outside could be a router for you. It could be always on. Why go to sleep? Okay. 
So then I'll finish, and I think I've used so much time now. Is that clock right? 10.14. I think we won't go on to the next topic, so I think we'll finish actually a little bit early today. And that will leave all the embedded OS stuff for next week. But I'd just like to say a few words about some of our research in this space, so what we think is interesting. Um, it doesn't cover everything. We've done a lot more stuff than this. But um, one of the first topics that we did in the, in the energy harvesting and uh, low power space was a thing called ASTAR. And that's because my, my student at the time, Fan, thought it would be, we have rankings on our conferences. So he thought it would be really funny to call his paper ASTAR, which is our top ranked conference. It only got into an A conference, but you know, whatever. Um, and so what does ASTAR do? Well, remember I said before, it's a problem that's kind of like economics. You have uh, production, you have storage, and you have demand. Well, ASTAR gives you a really simple way to match energy demand to available supply. So it monitors all the time the, the super cap. Just reading the ADC, you've seen me do that here at the front, and I think you do it in your assignment too. Very easy. And seeing what the level of charge is. When you need to charge up your cap, um, and we use solar for the most part in the experiments, and thermal too, but let me stick to solar. Um, a star will very gently always increase the rate at which tasks run, like a master clock for the device, if you like. Um, but in order to keep doing this, it must see that charge is accumulating until you reach an optimum level. If it sees ever that charge drops, well, then you know that you are running tasks too frequently. This is not sustainable. Eventually, the charge would be exhausted. So when it sees that, it backs off dramatically. It's actually based on a, um, uh, a, a slight reworking of TCP's congestion control approach. So another network's callback. But if you remember that, where you gradually increase in AIMD the amount of messages that you send, then you notice you sent too many because you have congestion. You dramatically back off. ASTAR does just the same thing. So super duper simple approach. But what's cool about it is we've deployed it in tons of different scenarios now, and it always works. It doesn't matter what you connect it to. You can connect it to RF energy harvesting or solar. It can be outdoors. It can be indoors. It will always quickly acquire a charge. It will keep it right at a developer-specified optimum level of charge. And if power fails, it will slow right down so that you get as much lifetime as possible. So this is the kind of stuff that, that we build in the software space here. Um, what else to say about that? Again, I think kind of interesting because it's something you all could easily build. If you remember enough of your courses, it's not tremendously complex. But because the space is quite new, because these devices have not been around that long, there are lots of low-hanging fruit like this. You know, lots of ideas that are simple and easy to understand, but people just haven't had yet. Another example is Ashok's work. Um, so Ashok's running the uh, practicals this year. You'll see a lot of him. And he built a system called Hyper. Um, and so the thing we noticed with ASTAR was, so that's all great uh, to use super caps and solar panels and stuff uh, in academia. But industry doesn't love it because industry wants to know what the worst case is. And the worst case for energy harvesting is always zero because it can always fail. What Ashok did was put this together with um, a long-life battery system in Hyper. And so what Hyper will do is let you, as a developer, specify like a slider bar for how much lifetime you require. Um, and then it will monitor the current consumed by the, excuse me, not current, the uh, charge uh, being consumed from a backup battery, as well as um, doing the A-star-like things on the supercapacitor to give you the best performance possible while giving you exactly that lifetime. So that means it's efficient in the sense that every last bit of the battery will be used by the time you hit the lifetime. You didn't waste any power that was there. And on the other hand, it's sustainable. So um, it constantly adjusts how much uh, charge can be consumed from the battery based on how much environmental power was harvested. So again, not super duper complex, but it just puts together you know, a supercapacitor, a long-life battery, and then does the simple maths and control loop that's required to make sure you get this deterministic lifetime. But again, um, I think what's interesting is, because at New Space, these things don't really exist yet. Uh, this is uh, only last year. 
And again, it's uh, uh, empty territory. Okay, I think that's where we'll leave it for today. Questions on anything from the energy lecture? Please. Sure. Tasks run, yeah. So it's like um, you can imagine it just like a clock tick, yeah. and then the OS has got to use it. Yeah. Um, and so it's when it arrives at an optimum, essentially that's when it's the uh, like when it comes to an equilibrium. Yes. Yeah. So uh, like let's say that your task, let, let's let's say that uh, the, the the actual button has dropped. Yeah. Or you're connected to a solar panel and, and you know your source is dropped. Yeah. Let me show a graph. Bear with me one sec here. It's easier with graphs. The main thing that, to remember, which is a bit weird, and uh, also comes up in TCP, is there's no equilibrium that doesn't change. So for that reason, you never stop gently probing and dramatically backing off. The main difference in the algorithm, must have some slides here. Let's see. Uh, how do I not have A star? I must do. Uh, what do you call it? Slides, Google? I've got some in here, I think. So the only difference to this and TCP is that we flip the optimization once you go above the optimum. So we don't enforce the optimum level as a maximum in hardware or anything like this. That's a good one. Uh, so it's a complicated graph. But basically, uh, this is a system that already reached an optimum voltage here. The developer specified 3.7. And, and then we kind of bash it, basically, to see how much we can knock it out of the optimum. We try and be honest here. So this is like the worst stuff we can do to it. So we, uh, on this, in this case, we um, start off with a 2 milliamp power source and a 20 milliamp load, whatever duty cycle it calculates. And you can see or maybe not, but it's not static. It's always increasing then dropping. In the optimum zone here, this is all linear. The moment it leaves the optimum zone, like happens, let's say right here, when we go from a five milliamp load to a 100 milliamp load, we just like, we, we, we connect to something huge. It momentarily pulls uh, the voltage down. That causes the task rate to dramatically back off uh, this is log scale right here, so it is dramatic. And then again, we kind of charge back up to the optimum. So I think these problems are really fun. You can speculate about, although I, I also think that it's very uh, easy to imagine patching it, to, which we did for a while, to do better at staying at the optimum, but it's actually really hard to make it work in all cases. So not saying it can't be done, but there aren't really many algorithms that try and do this at all. Um, and um, the, what we found is that like simple rules tend to work the best. If that digression wasn't too much. So to answer the question? OK, cool. Um, let me show you one last thing. Here's an actual solar. Here, so here's an, uh, a version with um, the sun on a windowsill, I think, in Fan's office. These are the kind of variances you get. You can see, like, um, uh, huge changes during the day. The amount of tasks that we can run changes dramatically. But what A-star does quite reliably is charges right up, keeps it at optimum voltage. It's noisy here because we have a lot of kind of big changes. Here we lose power at sunset, and it backs off as far as the developer will let it. That's like an emergency shutoff kind of spec there. OK. Final questions? Then we'll leave it there for today, and we'll pick up with operating systems next week.